Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. Exodus chapter 11. The entire chapter is a short one, only ten verses long. We're moving into that final plague, the death of the firstborn. God has given Pharaoh every opportunity to repent. Pharaoh has refused to repent. God is going to move the hearts of the Egyptians and even some of Pharaoh's servants to suddenly be generous. It almost strikes you that there is a an attempted bribe going on here. The Egyptians, knowing that Pharaoh has hardened his heart, are saying, please, don't let another bad thing happen to us. And they're giving them money. They're giving them a lot of money. Jewels of silver, jewels of gold. And in verse 3 it says, The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. One man can do a lot of damage, even to those who hope the damage doesn't come to them. Little fly spoils the ointment of the apothecary. Blow fro, lie fly, moo bo, hey lo, daddy. Blood, frogs, lice, flies, moo for cattle. Boils, hail, locusts. Darkness, and now the D part, death. God has had it. Did you know there comes a point of no return? You can repent up to a certain point. And after that, even if there is repentance, God says judgment is still coming. He did that in the days of Manasseh. Even though there was a later repentance, a national repentance in the days of Josiah, God said, I'm still going to send the judgment because of the sins of Manasseh. We see sort of a half-hearted attempt, not at repentance, but at bribery here in this passage. With the Egyptians, God even moves their hearts to do it. We'll see why in a moment. But it is too late. Have you ever come to a point in your life when you decided, I think I'll go ahead and, and do that thing there, and then it was too late? And you really wished you had done it earlier, but it was too late? My mother used to have a little couplet that she would say, the saddest words of tongue or pen are these sad words, it might have been. It might have been. What difference would there have been if there was a different Pharaoh on the, on the throne? What difference would there have been if he had repented after the very first plague? What blessing might have come to Egypt and Israel still would have gotten to go without having seen the plagues, but what that might have cost Israel later when they didn't have the plagues to remind them that God is a judging God as well as a God of mercy. God has hidden those things from us in his sovereignty. But we can see lessons to learn from these events. Because God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In fact, God raised Pharaoh up for that same purpose of showing his powerful judgments. Paul says so in Romans. It wasn't just that Pharaoh happened to come to the throne at that particular point in history. Pharaoh was raised up by God so that God might crush him. 
and so that he might destroy Egypt with the plagues, and that his name might be declared as wonderful throughout all of the earth. We do not understand the ways of God. You recall that last time as we closed the plague of darkness, we saw that there was darkness at Mount Sinai, and that darkness at Sinai was two things. Number one, it was a point of reference. And number two, it was a warning memory for Israel when they were tempted to sin. The point of reference and the warning memory took them back to the plague of darkness in the land of Egypt. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. This is Deuteronomy chapter 4, right before we have the restatement of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Specifically, the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, that's Mount Sinai. What did they see? They saw darkness. When the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, that they may teach their children. And you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire into the midst of heaven, and darkness and clouds and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude. Only you heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them on two tables of stone. Moses reminded Israel again of the smoking Shekinah in chapter 5, where you have the restatement of the Ten Commandments. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick darkness. Joshua reminded the people that it was an impenetrable darkness of the Shekinah that protected Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. And when he cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And ye brought and ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. We saw that when God brings darkness of the Shekinah, it's for judgment. We saw darkness shrouds the invisible God so that we will not see him and die. We saw that darkness was part of the curses of the law on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim for their failure to abide by the covenant of the law. We saw that thick darkness of the Shekinah was what was seen at Calvary. Three hours like the three days in the tomb, just like the three days of darkness in Egypt. That was the darkness of judgment of the sin laid on Christ. We saw as at the creation, like at the moment of salvation, Jesus brought light out of the darkness. We saw that in hell through all of eternity, it will always be darkness. And in heaven throughout all of eternity, there will never be any darkness. And there will not be time as we know it in heaven because there will be nothing to mark the passage of time like sun and moon and stars. Time shall be no more. All 24 hours of the day will be light, no unprofitable downtime in sleep. Time will be done away and we will never be tired. And we saw how God tells us that twice to encourage us in Revelation 21, 25 and Revelation 22, 5. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day for there shall be no night there. And there shall no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And then we saw that beautiful contrast to the darkness and the burning of hell in Revelation 21 and the description of the, the new Jerusalem descending from God out of heaven. And we read that text in Revelation 21, and then we saw Revelation chapter 22 and the river of the water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Incredible promises, incredible expectancy that we look forward to with joy. It's coming. It may be coming for some of us sooner than we realize. Some of us may not make it through this service. Some of us may be on our way home and go to heaven on the way home. Some of us may last one or two more days. Some of us may last a week. Some may last a year. We don't know when Christ is coming back. Some of us may last several more years before this country collapses and the believers are killed. But what we have to look forward to is the light of heaven. For believer, there is no darkness or night 
in the presence of God. We saw the three parallels, light versus darkness equals salvation versus damnation equals freedom of Christ versus bondage to Satan. We saw the judgments in Revelation parallel the ten plagues right at the end of the final bold judgments before the annihilation of the wicked earth by Christ at the second coming. We saw how the bold judgments hit ferociously fast, one right after another, with no space between them as in the seal and trumpet judgments, which have spaces between them. But, but the bold judgments happen one right after another in, I believe, less than a week's time. The last week of the Great Tribulation. And there we see the darkness and we see the fire and we see men blaspheming the name of God which hath power over these plagues and they repented not to give him the glory. They didn't like the scorching of the fire and so they are basically saying, quit burning us, okay, says God. So he sent them darkness. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. All of the plagues that you find in Exodus are repeated in the book of Revelation. And when we get to this last plague, the plague of death, God wipes out not just firstborn, he wipes out 50% of the population of earth. He makes it very clear that he is the God who can give life and sustain life, or he is the God who, when he says so, you will die. Serious warnings, all foreshadowed for us in the plagues of the book of Exodus. Darkness precedes death and the fire of testing. Even for the believer, our works will be tested by fire. Every man's work shall be made manifest, 1 Corinthians 3.13-15. through 15. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And we closed last week, or two weeks ago, last week was Reformation Sunday, but two weeks ago, we closed with the question, are you ready for darkness and death? And I reminded you that a few weeks ago, I was in Alabama for the installation of Judy's gravestone and was once again reminded of the shortness of time before we stand before Christ to give an account and have our lives tested by the fire of the Shekinah glory. The unbeliever will be cast into fire and darkness for eternity. The believer will either be watching his works burn up, or he will receive heavenly rewards to last forever. So that brings us to chapter 11, payday, better late than never in verses 1 through 10. What we have here in these verses that I read to you just a few moments ago, it's sort of a nutshell on the law of harvest. There's a very encouraging principle in scripture. God always makes sure that you get paid he always makes sure that you get paid one way or another for the work that you do for him. Did you know that? He guarantees it. That's one of the key principles of the law of harvest. God always makes sure you get paid one way or another for the work that you do for him. We have some key passages on that. And this first passage, Galatians chapter 6, is one that you've heard me mention at least in passing on a number of occasions before. The context is paying the pastor and sharing with other believers. And all the passages which I have listed for you, oh, five or six weeks ago, that dealt with works and rewards fall under this heading too. All of them relate to the law of harvest. But let me read for you once again Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate, that's the word for share. The Greek word means to share. Let him that is taught in the word communicate with him that teacheth in all good things. So the context is paying the pastor. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. 
And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all, all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So it starts off by talking about paying the pastor. And by the way, thank you all so much for the uh, Pastor Appreciation Month gift that you participated in. There's a little thank you note in your bulletins today that says thank you for doing that. Uh, it starts off with that, and then it closes with be sure you're sharing with other believers who have genuine needs. That word especially is the word melista in Greek. It's a definitive term. It means by that I mean to say. It's not just a matter of going out and you know sharing with some kind of a humanistic good works organization that rescues you know dying dogs or something like that. It's talking about the sharing is to be with other believers who have genuine needs that you are able to meet, that you know about, that God has brought to your attention, and he will hold you accountable for it. Just like he holds you accountable for your responsibility to those who are teaching you the word. That particular idea of the law of harvest is illustrated in one of the beautiful songs of David, which is recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 24 and following. I was also upright before him and have kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore, because he did that, because he was upright and because he kept himself from iniquity, therefore the Lord hath recompensed me, that is, he paid me back, according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. It's the law of harvest. What David sowed, God pays him back for. Next verse. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. What you sow is what you reap. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. With the froward, that's a word that means stubborn or perverse or recalcitrant. With the froward, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. <laughs> I love that phrase. Thou wilt show thyself unsavory. Very unpleasant, very distasteful, we might say. Are you froward? Are you stubborn? Are you perverse? God is going to become very untasteful to you in the way that he pays you back. Verse 28, And the afflicted people thou wilt save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. Payday someday. Payday better late than never for the believer, but even though the unbeliever does not yet see his payday, as Pharaoh did not see his payday coming, it will happen. That law of harvest is found all over the scriptures. We find it many times in the Old Testament prophets. We find it in the Psalms. We find it, in fact, all the way down to the book of Revelation. Let me just give you a couple of references. We'll not spend a lot of time on this. But, for example, Isaiah chapter 3, verses 10 and, uh, verses 10 and 11. Say ye to the righteous that it will be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Law of harvest. You sow, you reap. You sow, you reap. What you sow, that's what you're going to reap. It will be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit. That's a harvest of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. Law of harvest. Psalm 62, 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Law of harvest. We get into Revelation chapter 13 and a little bit later in Revelation chapter 20, we see it applying out again. Chapter 13, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. When you understand the law of harvest, it enables you to understand what is happening in the world when God acts in judgment. And you are guaranteed that he will act in judgment against those who have rebelled against him. Chapter 20, verse 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. 
and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Payday, someday. It's coming. And there will be a test of our works and there is going to be a payday according to the law of harvest. Now let me give you some of the practical applications of lessons that we learn from that passage in Exodus chapter 11 as it applies to us today. How does this affect us as Christians in those two or three passages that we just read out of the New Testament a moment ago? Number one, we discover that in this law of harvest, in the planting and the watering and the reaping, the first lesson to learn is the unity of Christian labor. The unity of Christian labor. 1 Corinthians 3.8 Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. There is a unity in Christian labor. I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. God designed the church to be a body with every member of the body participating, not merely going along for the ride. With every member in the body using the gifts and the resources and the abilities and talents and skills in the way that God intended them for the benefit of the body, just like a human body. That's the way your whole human body works. And when one part of the body doesn't work right, the whole body suffers. And Paul explains that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. But here he puts it in the context of a harvest, the law of harvest. And he shows us the unity of Christian labor. He that planteth and he that watereth are one. You may not be doing the same thing that somebody else is doing. One guy's out there plowing the field and dropping seeds. Another guy is out there with buckets and pouring water on the seeds. Another guy comes along later and he uses a scythe and cuts down the harvest and carries it to the granary and somebody else winnows it. But they all have one goal in mind. That's the way that it should be in the body of Christ. That's the way that it should be with each one of us. As we consider ourselves a part of this small group of believers here, there's not a whole lot of other people to shove the work off on. We are one. But it's not like this um, new theory in the public school system whereby to get the students to do work so that all the students can get good grades, the teachers put them all into groups. And they have to work on a project. You know about this, I hope. It's one of the horrible things that goes on in public schools and in colleges, too. So they put them together in groups of four or five. The teacher always puts at least one good student in each group. And then the whole group theoretically works on the project. But in real life, what happens is one or maybe two of the students work really hard because those one or two students really want a good grade and the rest of them just sort of float along. And when the project is turned in, it's a good project, and so they all get A's, even though three or four of them never did anything on the project. That's not the way God grades. That's not the way God gives rewards. Paul makes it clear here. Every man should receive his own reward according to his own labor. You won't be able to say, well, I went to that great church, Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood, New Jersey, where Dr. McIntyre was the preacher, and boy, that was an exciting church, and boy, the church stood against this, and the church stood for this, and the church made this kind of an impact, the church had this kind of a testimony. God's going to say, and so what did you do? And what you did, was it everything that you could do? 
or did you let it slide? That's what Exodus 11 is talking about when God says, I've had it over my eyeballs with Pharaoh and Egypt. Payday is coming. The second practical application that we learn, both from Exodus 11 and also from the New Testament where we find these principles restated, is the guarantee that you will be paid. The guarantee that you will be paid. Israel had worked in Egypt for 400 years. During a good portion of that 400 years, they didn't get paid. They were in slavery. But God guarantees that you will be paid. We find that restated in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, a passage that's usually read at funerals, and so we don't tend to think of it in this context, but listen to verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. I love that word abounding. Grace abounding to the chief of sinners. Read the works of John Bunyan. We read the works of John Newton and Amazing Grace. Abounding, abounding, abounding. Yes, God's love is abounding to us, but you know what we're called to do? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not just always getting by in the work of the Lord. Not always just barely by the skin of my teeth do I squeak by with a D minus always abounding in the work of the Lord. And here is the promise. For as much as you know, not you guess, not you hope, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God guarantees a payday. God guarantees to his servants that they're going to receive for what they have done. The third lesson we learn is the connection of Christian labor to three very important elements of the New Testament. Faith, love, and hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. In the sight. God is watching. You know, I think we live a lot of our lives as though God weren't watching. Uh, as though God were looking the other way, as if God were giving us a, a pass, you know, so that we can get out of there and not have to do this or that or the other thing. In the Old Testament, thou, Lord, seest me. In the New Testament, in the sight of God and our Father. You see, there is a connection between Christian labor and faith. When you read the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, you know that every one of them is commended for what he did because of his faith? Not one of them is commended for having faith in the ethereal realm whereby it was a discussion that never had an impact on his life. Faith always works. And faith without works is dead. Labor is connected to faith. In that verse, the second thing that labor is connected to is love. How many husbands go to work every day, and some at very miserable jobs, because they love their families, 
and they want to provide for them. Love is a very powerful motivator for working well. How many wives work diligently at their home because they love their husband and their children? Love is a very powerful motivator for work. You look at the children of Israel in chapter 11, and in all the preceding chapters as the plagues have been going on, and they're learning to trust the God who is judging e Egypt and taking care of them, where those plagues are not hitting the land of Goshen. And they're going to learn to work for him. They're going to learn to follow him. They're going to learn to go through the trials because he's there with them. Love, a powerful motivating factor for Christian labor. And hope is the third thing listed in that verse. Hope connected to labor. How many of you go to work each day or did when you were in the working category? How many of you go to work each day because you hope that at the end of the week you're going to get a paycheck? Would you go to work if there was no guarantee or if there was a very slim guarantee that you were going to get a paycheck at the end of the week? There's expectancy, and so you work. Law of harvest. In all three of those, love, faith, and hope, brings you to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There is nothing in Scripture that is random. It's all tied together. It goes back to certain basic principles that God insists that we learn all the way through Scripture. And yet we fail to learn them. The next practical lesson related to this payday to the law of harvest is the motivation for and the objects of Christian labor. The motivation for and the objects of Christian labor. That's out of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Now, an unrighteous boss might forget the work that you've done. When it comes time for a raise, he says, there's not going to be any raises this year. And he forgets all the extra overtime that you put in and all the extra hours and all the special things that you did and doing things that weren't really your job, but you did them anyway because it had to get done. It says God is not unrighteous to forget it. He's not unrighteous to forget your work. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. He knows why you did it, your motivation for doing it was your love for him, which you have showed toward his name. And how did you do that? How did you show it? What was the object of your Christian labor? In that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Well, that's the same thing that we saw just a moment ago over there in Galatians chapter 6, isn't it? whereby you are meeting the needs of other believers who have genuine needs. Not wants, but genuine needs. Paul has told us all that if we have food and raiment, let us be there with content. He didn't even say good food and fancy clothes. He just said food and clothes. And all of us have more than that. Same thing is said here in Hebrews 6. Number five. God chooses the form in which he pays us for our labor. And you know, it may not be exactly what we thought it was going to be. 
We see this clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. Paul is writing and he says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, that's in one realm, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? That's in a different realm, isn't it? Now we can be thankful that that principle works because it works in reverse too. Because <laughs> when you labor here in the physical realm, it's actually building heavenly rewards in the spiritual realm. Not merely building a paycheck here. Not merely building a bank account here. Not merely building wealth and land and property and cars and boats and all the other stuff that we accumulate here. But that goes both ways. Paul is sowing spiritual things, but he said it's no big deal if we reap your carnal things. And you know, sowing spiritual things also reaps eternal things. Things that are not seen, reserved in heaven for you. God chooses the form in which he pays us for our labor. And then we find the proportionality of Christian labor. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. If you plant one seed, you're going to get one plant. So well, I, I dropped a seed in the ground. I mean, man, look at me. I, I dropped a seed in the ground. Good old me. Pat yourself on the back. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You get one plant. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully, you get many plants. And each plant produces many seeds. He that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. That's stated for us in that passage in Galatians also that we read a moment ago, Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. But there is one area in which God guarantees a specific type of reaping. Galatians 6, 8. He that soweth to his flesh shall, that's not maybe, or most of the time, or even part of the time, it's he shall reap of the flesh corruption. It's like if you sprinkle acid on something, it will eat holes in that something. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. So when we're dealing with the spiritual realm, there are certain types of guarantees that always take place. And the last half of the verse says the same thing. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You sow to the flesh, it's destructive. You sow to the spirit, it's productive. How are you sowing? God reaches a point of no return if you're sowing to the flesh. That's what happened to Pharaoh. That's why we've reached chapter 11 in Exodus. Each of these lessons that I'm summarizing from New Testament principles... Every one of them is now being summarized by God as he deals with Pharaoh who is about to see the little boy that he thought would be the next Pharaoh, the little boy whom he loved as his son, the little boy whom he was training to be a god, and that night he's going to watch that little boy drop dead. You sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. Our bodies die. And they corrupt. Read 1 Corinthians 15. You know it from your own experience. But he that soweth of the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Moses could have given up a long time before this. Moses could have said after the fifth plague, you know, Pharaoh is not getting any better. And I think this is kind of like putting pressure on the, the Jews because Pharaoh is making them work so hard. And I think I'm out of here. 
But Moses didn't give up. How many times have you been tempted to give up? I bet if I asked for a show of hands, every one of us here would say, there was at least one time in my life, <laughs> at least one, when I was tempted to give up on something that I knew I should be doing. I'm not going to ask for the show of hands, but in your heart you can raise your hand. You knew you were supposed to be doing something. You knew God wanted you to do something. But you said, I'm out of here. I'm going to give up. Ever happened to you? Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if, if, two of the biggest letters in the Bible, I-F, if, if, if we faint not. So easy to faint. It's so easy to give up. So easy to throw in the towel. It's so easy to quit. Now the Jews have worked in Egypt for 400 years and a good portion of the last part of that time was as slaves and they had not been paid. So God decided to pay them back. And he paid them back with interest. We'll close here. What are you sowing in relationship to the Lord's work? How much time do you put into it each week? Is one hour per week on Sunday all you really commit to him? And even that is flexible if you have something else that you'd rather be doing, like making money. How committed are you? Every man should receive for his own labor. It's not a group effort whereby everybody gets the same payment that the diligent students put into the project. Every man has his own work and every man receives for his own labor and every man will individually stand before Christ and every woman and every boy and every girl what are you sowing in relation to the Lord's work our gracious Heavenly Father how we thank you once again for your word and for its power Father we pray that you convict our hearts of sin all of us have been slothful at some point in our lives in the Lord's work We've all made excuses why we can't do this or that, and why somebody else ought to do that, and after all, we're too good for that, or that's not our gift, or whatever else excuses we use to sound pious and religious. Instead of putting our hand to the plow and not looking back, putting our shoulder into the work, straining our muscles and our minds, our bodies and our spirits, using the gifts that you gave to us and not complaining that you didn't give us some other gifts. We pray, Father, that you will take your word as it has gone forth today and that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 692, God will take care of you. He always pays his servants. <laughs>